Hello, I'm Frank Hutchison. I'm Meredith Hutchison Hartley. And I'm Emily Geddes. And welcome back to the Hidden History of Business podcast. April 18th is National Tax Day in the United States. At well, least this year. This year. This year. And it's everybody's least favorite holiday in America. Yay. So for those of our, our listeners outside the U.S., that is the deadline for filing your personal income tax. Federal. Yes. Sorry, yes. yes. Your personal pers- federal income tax. Yes. And usually the state income tax is done along with that, too, if you mm-hmm. have a state income tax. But for the most part, people will file their tax returns and pay their taxes in an orderly fashion. You know, everybody gathers at midnight, mailbox, to drop off their <laughs> tax returns. Yes. 11.59. Yes. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't always so, particularly with the first tax on domestic products in the United States. In the period following the Revolutionary War and the disastrous Articles of Confederation, the new constitutional government assumed the war debt of $54 million. The federal government also assumed $25 million of the state's debts so the in exchange in, The individual for, debt carried by each of those states. Yes. And in exchange, those states gave up their claims on all the western lands, which is basically those lands beyond the Appalachian Mountains. So if you don't know, if you, we'll have a link to this on our site, but it used to be that all those states, Virginia and South Carolina and North Carolina, once you hit the Appalachian Mountains, I just went into a southern accent, oh my gosh, <laughs> their borders just became straight lines going all the way out to the Mississippi River. They gave up those lands in exchange for the federal government taking on their debt from the Revolutionary War. The federal government, which is brand new, the first president, George Washington, and you have the first secretary of the treasury, which is Al- Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. It's from the musical. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and they were behind this plan yeah, of they, assuming they, the state's debts. Mm-hmm. They really were. Alexander uh, wanted to establish a good financial system in the United States. And this is one of the tools that he used. But it was not a universally uh, adored plan. No. Well, there's those who thought that you know, whoever had the debt was really responsible for it. And so why would I take on more debt when it wasn't my debt? Now, Thomas Jefferson was one who was on that side of the argument. He was the first Secretary of State. Yes. And the Alexander Hamilton musical, simply called Hamilton, actually refers to this at one point in their cabinet battle, the first cabinet battle between Jefferson and Hamilton, talking about, Jefferson talks about why should, um, if New York's in debt, why should Virginia bear it? Our debts are paid. And then he ends his little rap battle section by saying, when Britain taxed our tea, we got frisky. Imagine what's going to happen when you try to tax our whiskey. That is what happened. Alexander looked around and all revenue up until this point for the federal government had come from import taxes. Anything that was imported could be taxed. The federal government controlled that. The states did not. But Alexander looked at it and said they're about as high as they can be. And at the same time you also started having more and more economic trouble coming from those countries that were exporting into the United States. He, They were able to see that this revenue was not going to be sustainable in the long term. War was coming throughout the Atlantic and Europe. So they had to come up with a different revenue source to try and pay off these debts. And Alexander looking around, and it was on distilled spirits. We're talking about whiskey. For the most part. It wasn't just whiskey. Mm. It was all distilled spirits. But whiskey was the primary one. First of all, Alexander looked at it and said, whiskey is a luxury, so this would be a luxury tax. And oh, by the way, there's also a sizable group of people who are already talking about how alcohol is a tool of the devil. To some degree, Alexander was right in how whiskey was being consumed where he was from in New York and in the urban centers he was living in. But the problem is not everyone is from New York. So his experience seeing all these rich people being a luxury good was not how whiskey was used throughout the rest of the country. In March of 1791, the whiskey tax was passed by Congress. By November of that year, Washington, as the president, had defined the revenue districts, revenue supervisors for each of those districts, inspectors, and had set their pay, which meant that it was now part of the federal government. They had a mechanism to collect this tax. I also want to be clear, though, this wasn't just a whole bunch of city folk dictating what whiskey taxing would be. George Washington distilled tons of whiskey at Mount Vernon. That was a major product at Mount Vernon. Yes, because anyone who had excess grain would distill it into alcohol One, it's easier to store. Two, it's easier to transport. And three, a lot of people accepted it as pay. And we'll talk about this a whole lot more in our upcoming whiskey episode. Well, with all this being done, everyone lines up and pays their taxes peacefully. (laughs) Not quite. The tax was extremely controversial from the very get-go because you had people who perceived it as a tax primarily on the rural districts, especially in western Pennsylvania 
and Kentucky. Yeah, this tax exposed a lot of kind of fault lines in the brand new country. There was the rural versus the urban, the eastern versus the western, the richer versus the poorer. The large farmers, the large corporations, if you will, versus the small local farmers and distillers. Mm -hmm. As I said, it was perceived initially as a rural tax because the small farmers were the ones who were making the whiskey and they would use it to pay their bills and as a medium of exchange, not just for transport, because it was easier to transport a barrel of whiskey than it was bags of grain. And it was, I mean, it was legitimately a form of currency. And that's for a lot of reasons, because people were using it to drink safely, sanitize the water in some cases. It was viewed as medicinal. It was nutritional. But another reason why it was perceived to be a rural tax was because of the way the tax was structured. There was two ways of paying. One was a per gallon fee. And in Depending on the situation, it could be as low as six cents a gallon. What changed the situation? What were the variables? Well, the other the two variables is one is by a per gallon, but the other is by paying a flat fee. Mm. And that flat fee, if you produced a lot of whiskey, meant that your tax per gallon was very low, the six cents per gallon. So you're saying it was a flat fee like your distillery pay- pays this amount regardless of how much you're producing? Yes. That was what it was. You did have those Western farmers who were running small stills. In the East, you had basically the industrial production of alcohol. They were paying the flat fee. They looked upon it saying, well, we really don't like being taxed. But then he thought a little bit, wait a minute. If I just play a flat fee and those guys out West had to pay a per gallon fee, that gives me an advantage. They were using it as a form of economic warfare against the small locals. Very much so. There was another economic part of this equation, and that is that in the East, whiskey sold for more than it did in the West. Now, one of the objections that people had to this whiskey tax was they claimed it was taxation without representation, which should sound familiar to those who had just fought in the Revolutionary War over a similar issue. Which However, a lot of the settlers in Western Pennsylvania and Kentucky had. A lot of them were war veterans. And the reason they, they were there is because the federal government, in order to pay these people, because they couldn't, they didn't have money, so they couldn't pay them in money. So what they did is they gave them land. So what's the difference? Why was this not taxation without representation, whereas the earlier war that they fought, you know, throwing the tea in Boston Harbor. Let's mm-hmm. talk about that a little bit. The representation was Congress. So why were they claiming there wasn't? We hear this argument even today, mm-hmm. is that those people don't represent me. These farmers hadn't voted for this tax or anything else, and so they were up in arms. Well, they hadn't voted for Alexander Hamilton. The Secretary of State, the Secretary of the Treasury, these other cabinet positions were appointed by the President, who, yeah, they'd voted for, but they hadn't voted for these people directly, so they felt they weren't being represented by them. We see this now. I mean, in the current presidential debate, we hear a lot about activist judges and this debate about how it should be all democratic versus, well, yeah, but we have these checks and balances with people who are appointed and Mm -hmm. we're still having this debate today. We really are. So the tax is instituted. What happens next? They responded just as they had done with the British. You're going to pass this law. You passed this law, which was in March and in uh, July of the same year, July 27th, they have a meeting at the Redstone Old Fort in Fayette County, Pennsylvania. That they call for delegates to come to a formal assembly. And that assembly meets in uh, Pittsburgh in September. Fortunately, most of the people who come are reasonable moderates, and they're kind of talking about this, and they put petitions together and send them off to Congress and to the state legislature. Well, yeah, you had kind of a breakdown. There were some people who were arguing for a violent revolution again, but there were a lot of folks who were saying, whoa, whoa, chill, let's try diplomatic well, channels first. At this meeting, mostly they were moderate. It, well, it worked. I mean, they proposed Somewhat, a lot of yeah. things. They talked about uh, reducing the tax to some degree. And they did. Uh, by May of the following, year, there was actually a reduction, a one cent reduction in the tax. One cent, woohoo! Right, but jumping Um, back to September of 1791, we had tax collectors who were going out trying to collect mm -hmm. this whiskey tax and not always being greeted with open arms. Well, well, I would say they were greeted with open arms. While their friends put tar on them and then cover them with feathers and put them on a rail and ran them out of town. Which, we gotta say, nowadays it seems like kind of a, a humorous picture in our minds, but this was horrific, painful. This was a brutal way to treat well, And it wasn't being. just pouring tar. What they would do first is they would whip you or scratch you so you would have open wounds, and then they would pour the tar, which is caustic, which would cause greater open and spots. Hot. 
and it's incredibly hot. So you have burns, you have it getting deep down into your tissue, and then they dump the feathers on because that makes it harder to clean off. So they know it will cause damage for longer. But, I mean, it was it was a horrifically painful experience. And that was uh, actually on September 11th, 1791. Robert Johnson was tarred and feathered. He was the first. And that sounds remarkably like what people were doing back in mm-hmm. 1775. Another one who was sent to serve warrants for the attackers of uh, Robert Johnson was also whipped, tarred, and feathered as well. So they couldn't even arrest the attackers. No, they Gosh. couldn't. Gosh. And all this means that it looked just like the period leading up to the Revolutionary War. Now, Washington did exercise a lot of restraint. He didn't want to aggravate the situation. So what he did is Alexander Hamilton drafted a proclamation for George Washington. It was reviewed by the Attorney General at that time, Edmund Randolph, who kind of toned it down. This kind of goes on for another two years. People are resisting paying the taxes. They're driving off the tax collectors. And finally, what you have is in in 1794, in May of that year, you have Federal District Attorney uh, William Rawl uh, issue subpoena for more than 60 distillers in Pennsylvania who have not paid the excise test. And Federal Marshal David Lennox goes out to deliver the subpoenas. And most of them are delivered without incident. However, one of the problems with the subpoenas was that under the law at that time, if you received a subpoena, you had to appear in federal court in Philadelphia. Which is all the way on the other side of of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. So they had to travel from Western Pennsylvania to Eastern Pennsylvania. And most of the distillers could not afford to do that. It was expensive to travel. They'd be away from their farms and they just couldn't do it. Another character is here at this time. That's uh, General John Neville. He was the federal tax inspector for Western Pennsylvania. And he is accompanying the federal marshal, David Lennox. And on July 15th, as they approach the Miller Farm, which is about 10 miles south of Pittsburgh, someone fires warning shots. Neville returns home to his plantation that he has because he is a wealthy planter and a large-scale distiller. The next day, 30 militiamen from Mingo Creek show up at Neville's home, which happens to be fortified because it was on the frontier. Uh, Bower Hill is the name of it. And they demand that the federal marshal be surrendered to them. Neville fires upon the rebels and mortally wounds Oliver Miller. The rebels retreat for a little while to gather reinforcements and they come back the next day with 600 men. And now they have a commander. Major James McFarland. Neville, meanwhile, has also received reinforcements. Ten U.S. soldiers. Oh, from, ten. From Pittsburgh. That'll be super effective. And what's interesting is that they're under the command of Major Abraham Kit Kirkpatrick, who is a brother-in-law of his wife. A Kirkpatrick had Neville leave the house and hide in a nearby ravine. Uh, meanwhile, Lennox comes back along with Neville's son, who, but they're captured by the rebels. They try to negotiate for a little while. The women and children are allowed to leave the house. And then, basically, everybody starts fighting firing at each other. Just open warfare. This goes on for about an hour, and then McFarlane calls for a ceasefire. So he steps out, another shot comes out from the house, and he falls dead. The rebels really get ticked off, and they end up setting fire to the house. Kirkpatrick surrenders. The soldiers are allowed to leave, although one soldier did die from his wounds. Kirkpatrick, yeah. Lennox, and Neville's son, uh, Presley, are kept as prisoners, although they do later escape. Now it's August 1st. 7,000 people gathered at Craddock's Field. You have people saying, we're going to secede from the United States. Mm-hmm. They even come up with their own flag. So it actually has progressed to full-on open rebellion. Yes. Now there's also some people talking moderation and expressing support. But there's um, 7,000 people who are, yes. you know, engaging in warfare. Yes. George Washington consults with his cabinet, and he comes up with a sort of a compromise, two-pronged approach. One, he puts together a peace commission to go and talk to the rebels. And they do go there, and really what it creates is vision in the rebels. What Washington also did at the same month is he also called out, with the deepest regret, the militia of New Jersey, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, a total of over 12,000 men. In October, they're in Pennsylvania, and he joins them. So he's actually leading the troops again. He is the first and only president who actually leads combat troops in the field. Which is a pretty smart move, honestly, because Washington was pretty well respected. And so him writing out, no one wants to be the guy who shoots George Washington. It was a very, very smart move. It was, but he also didn't stay there for very long. He was there for maybe a week or a little over a week. The governor of Virginia takes command. They keep marching off there. And finally, what happens is that everyone looks around and says, they have 12,000. 
we're all going to go home. So the rebels didn't want to actually deal with that massive army, and they all mm-hmm. disappear. They run back to their farms. They go hide in the woods. Yes, and the re- the rebellion collapses in the face of the twelve thousand. It's horrifically anticlimactic. All of that build up. Washington leads out this army, and they get there and it's like, okay, nothing's it happening. Gets, Let's go home. It gets even more anticlimactic because the federal government then tries to enforce the laws. They arrest twenty people and bring them back to Philadelphia for trial. The grand jury indicts twenty four men for high treason. But but they didn't capture most of them. No, most of them just went off to the right. west. So, so only 10 had, actually stood trial. Yes, only and ten. then only two were convicted. Yes. One gets convicted because he beat up a tax collector and burned his house. Mm, minor details. Yeah, minor. Right. The other one was described as a simpleton who was encouraged by one of the leaders, David Bedford, to rob the U.S. mail. And both men were sentenced to death by hanging, but then both of them were pardoned by President George Washington. Yes. And uh, yeah, the Pennsylvania state courts, they did some more prosecuting. They were a little more successful than the federal. But when you consider the number of people who were involved, it's minuscule the people who were actually successfully prosecuted. And even those were prosecuted for simple crimes, you know, assault and rioting. Not as well. high treason. Right. Yes. As a result of all this is that, first of all, most people approved of putting down the rebellion with George Washington. There were those who didn't. There was a lot that accused Alexander Hamilton of engineering this to gain more power for the federal government. But what it did demonstrate was that the new national government would be willing and able to actually enforce its own laws, which was an important principle here. It also acted to suppress violence against the federal government in the process. With a lot of those rebels went home and started using the democratic process. They started voting and using organization and local laws to try to fight their work through their disagreements. And what you would find is that most of those people would become Republicans and vote for Thomas Jefferson. Of course, when he enters office, one of the first things he does in 1801 is eliminate the whiskey tax. Mm-hmm. What it really does address, though, is how do you protest? And that's something which has had to be constantly re-examined. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At this time, you protested through violent means. That's how we started the Revolutionary War. Here, they tried the same things, and it was suppressed. So people learned that's not how you do it. Less than 70 years later, there would be a civil war because we couldn't peacefully resolve the questions that we had. And well, and frankly, these issues still come up today. I mean, there are modern instances. For example, the occupation of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge in eastern Oregon recently could be considered somewhat similar to the Whiskey Rebellion in that it used some arguably violent means to protest what they saw as some kind of taxation without representation. Well, and you, from the business perspective, you have the same kind of conflict between the larger folks who can afford certain fees and have power with the government because of their economic size and the smaller local farmers and distillers, in theory. For instance, in the modern gluten-free industry, there is a huge controversy going on right now between these large corporate gluten-free manufacturers like General Mills because they buy oats that are contaminated with gluten and they clean them. It's They can do it on a large scale very cheaply. And they have lobbied to have laws changed to make that very easy for them. But then you have all, a lot of these smaller farmers who produce gluten-free oats in a much safer fashion called a purity protocol. They're producing a higher quality, but it's much more expensive for them to do the testing. There's a lot of manipulation of laws back and forth now to try to change the regulations. And that's exactly what happened with the Whiskey Rebellion. You had the different forces that were kind of for the tax and against the tax. You had the economic interests that were going on. And the same battle or the same conflict plays out over and over again. And we see that in the modern day. We see it in the past. It's part of human nature. If you like this episode, consider leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or social media. You can find snark, updates, and behind-the-scenes peeks of production on Twitter. Our handle is at HiddenBiz. That's at Hidden B-I-Z. You can also find us on Facebook as The Hidden History of Business. Music for this podcast is from the album Time Within Itself by Michael Waldrop and used with permission of the artist. You can find out more about it on iTunes and Amazon. If you'd like to access show notes and multimedia content and the periodic rant from your hosts, be sure to visit our website at www.hiddenhistoryofbusiness.com. 